Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Judith Liu. I hold the Lady Margaret uh, Chair in Divinity, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the second of the Humanitas uh, lectures in this particular se series. The Humanitas professorships bring specialists in a variety of areas, both scholarly and practitioners, uh, to offer lectures within Cambridge and Oxford. And this particular series of lectures comes under the broader umbrella uh, of women's rights. And Professor Mona Siddiqui, who's giving these lectures, has brought together with that central topic of women's rights, uh, feminism and religion, to make a uh, explosive, uh, perhaps, a combination there. Uh, many of you will already know, and this will be why you're here, of the work of Professor Siddiqui. Uh, she holds a chair in the University of, of Edinburgh in uh, Islamic and Interreligious Studies. Uh, she works on Islamic jurisprudence, on Christian and Islamic relations, uh, and on various other aspects, particularly relating to feminism and women's rights. Uh, many of you perhaps uh, will be aware of her work outside the academy, uh, perhaps listening to her uh, invariably uh, reflective contributions to uh, Radio 4, uh, Thought for the Day, uh, but may also be aware that she works in a number of other contexts representing uh, the areas in which she specialises. Uh, she is Vice Chair of uh, Global Agenda Council for Faith for the World Economic Forum. Uh, she's giving three lectures while she's here, uh, as well as a symposium on Thursday, the Symposium on Feminism, Religion and Women's Rights. Uh, but this evening, her lecture is on Mary in Christian-Muslim relations. And so it gives me great pleasure to invite Professor Mona Siddiqui to give her lecture. Thank you, Judy. Thank you, all of you, for some of you are familiar faces from yesterday, so thank you for returning and welcome to all the new participants. So today's lecture is called Mary in Christian Muslim Relations, and I just want to look at the place of Mary both in Islam and how Mary has been used as a symbol, as a motif, as a figure for talking um, about dialogue, but also the tensions that surround Mary in terms of how we use a symbol like this that, is, that, ha that has a presence both in Islam but also in the Christian tradition. The Quran is where you first read of Mary or Miriam. There is indeed a chapter, a complete surah, named after her. The Quran has many stories which point to some kind of converging narrative between Christians and Muslims, only for the two scriptures to part on the fundamentals of so many figures. Moses, Abraham and Adam are all involved in the drama of a divine conversation, but their stories overlap and differ. For the Quran, it's fair to say that the moral of almost every story points to divine justice and mercy, a God who communicates through humanity by sending messengers and prophets who come with the same primordial message, that of the unicity of God and the sovereignty of God. Prophecy is the highest human accolade in Islam, for it is a prophetic voice and life which acts as intermediate between God and humankind. And someone has said that Muhammad is seen by many as a barzakh or the isthmus between the absolute and the relative, the infinite and the finite, the eternal and the temporal. Mary, or Miriam as she is known too, carried such a person by the name of Isa or Jesus. His birth and vocation could have meant more than human prophecy. But in Islam, Jesus, the son of Mary, remains a human prophet in the long line of human prophets. His virgin mother, Mary, and his miraculous birth invite the Christic element, but the Christic element is not tied into the divine human matrix, but simply a reflection of God's will and power. Mary is revered by many in popular Islamic piety, but she's not the mother of God. She's not in Islam what she's in Roman Catholic Christianity, or indeed the Theotokos, the one who gave birth to the one who is God, one of her titles in Eastern Christianity. This was a title in theology since the time of Oregon, and the church confirmed this title at the Council of Ephesus. If Marian theology has exalted her for herself, in Islam her story is an example of virtue, obedience and piety, an example of the righteous. All of this comes to the fore when she is told that she will be carrying a child who will be a mercy from God, Jesus, who is known as a spirit of God in the Quran. 
A prophetic hadith also questioned whether Mary was superior to earlier figures, such as Pharaoh's wives, or the women in the Prophet's family, such as Khadija, Fatima, and Aisha. These are the women par excellence in the early Islamic world, still regarded as the symbols of female piety, emancipation, and fidelity. But Mary is different. She lives in daily piety within Muslim and Christian communities, and indeed one could argue that her presence haunts those who desire to see her. She appeared on several nights in different forms, sometimes in full body, at other times only half, surrounded by a halo of bright light. Sometimes she would appear in the domes of the church or above. This was a description of the appearance of the Virgin Mary, published in Cairo's Al-Hiram paper in 1968. Muslims and Christians flock to see this vision because Mary has a lasting appeal to the people of both these faiths. Many see her as an inspiring and reconciling figure between Islam and Christianity, between the past and the present, and between the feminine and the feminine ideal. <clears throat> Mary is often regarded as a meeting point, a bridge between Islam and Christianity. R.J. McCarthy wrote of Mary in The Two Faith that though Mary may not be a touchstone, she may well be a stepping stone. He wrote that the phrase chosen by God meant that she was chosen in the same way the prophets were chosen. And in 1988, Cardinal Lorenzo of the, Vat of the Vatican Secretariat for Non-Christians addressed a greeting to Muslims whom he called brothers and sisters in God. And he quoted Mary, the mother of Jesus whom both Christians and Muslims, without according her the same role and title, honor as a model for believers. The portrait of Mary was a surprising feature for even the earliest Christian respondents to Islam. Bartholomew of Edessa declared, in the entire Quran there do not occur any praises of Muhammad <coughs> or of his brother Amina, sorry, of his mother Amina, such as are found about our Lord Jesus Christ and about the Holy Virgin Mary. However, the view of her more benevolent role in interreligious dialogue in recent times has a more contested past. Amy Raymond Snyder's 2011 article on Moriscos and Marian scripture begins with a particular story. In 1526, an image of the Virgin Mary in the Aragonese church of Tobet broke out in a sweat. For 36 straight hours, perspiration dripped from this Madonna. Enough that it filled a glass, wrote Marco Xavier, a Carmelite friar who described the miracle. In a book published in 1613, he believed it was no coincidence that the Madonna had become so palpably distressed in 1526, the year when the Muslims and the crown of Aragon began to suffer the same fate that had been nested out to their co-religionists in the kingdom of Castile a quarter of a century earlier. Conversion to Christianity by royal decree. The statue sweating in the same way as the waters of baptism were splashing over thousands of angry and resistant converts was, Xavier wrote, an omen of the apostasies that these new Christians would commit and a presentiment of the damage that this vile and bestial people would inflict on Spain. Like many, though certainly not all, of his contemporaries, he believed that baptismal charism hadn't washed the taint of Islam from the Moriscos the forcibly converted Muslims and their descendants. The friar considered all Moriscos to be instead crypto-Muslims, people whose very presence in Spain endangered the Christian faith and the Christian realm. They were thus Mary's enemies rather than her spiritual children. Raymond Snyder states that the Virgin Mary straddled the frontier between their own faith and that of their Muslim neighbours. Erudite intellectuals able to read Arabic weren't the only Christians familiar with Mary's presence in Islam, for everyone from rulers to mere ordinary folk could hear miracle stories celebrating how Muslims entered churches to pay their respects to Jesus' mother and gave proof in other ways of their faith. But by the late 15th century, such tales were eclipsed by ones hinting instead at a reluctance to recognise Mary's role in Islam a stance that had hardened into refusal by the 16th century. Early, other early modern Christian tales took the next logical step by framing Muslims as actively dangerous to the Virgin. Such stories became so familiar to Spaniards that the celebrated Golden Age author Felix Lope de Vega, not sure if I pronounce that right, 
made them the crux of an important scene in one of his plays. The star of this drama is a Moroccan prince, a Muslim who decides to convert to Christianity upon hearing about Mary. As he moves towards baptism, he wishes to find out more about the different Marian images he has seen. He receives this illuminating answer from a friar. Many of them, the statues, date from the time when you Muslims destroyed the Christian nation of Spain. The Christians buried these excellent statues in the hills since they feared savage hands and their relics. And when afterwards the Christians gained with a thousand battles the lands they had lost earlier, the images appeared in the hills of various regions. The earliest of these legends featuring supposedly the Visigothic Marian images that had been hidden away from the Muslim threat in 711, only to re-emerge miraculously hundreds of years later with the advance of Christian military conquest, <coughs> appears to date from the late 14th century. By then, pilgrims visiting the increasingly important Marian pilgrimage, Shrine of Guadeloupe in the hills of Extra Extremadura, heard how the Madonna they venerated there had spent centuries buried underground, only to reveal herself when the Christians had driven the Muslims out of this land. <clears throat> in the Quran, only Moses, Abraham and Noah are mentioned by name more frequently than Mary. But Mary herself is mentioned more times in the Quran than in the entire New Testament. There are 70 verses in the Quran which refer to her, and she's mentioned specifically in 34 of these. She is in the Quran an example for the believers. The New Testament says, Greetings, O favoured one. The Lord is with you. Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favour with God. The Quran says, God has chosen you and purified you and chosen you above women of all people. But Mary's story is mysterious and is found within the few references to her in the Quran. Her mother is not mentioned by name in the Quran, but referred to as the wife of Imran. Islamic tradition has given her the name of Hannah, and she's considered to be a sister to Elizabeth. Before her birth, Mary's mother pledges to consecrate her unborn child to God's service. And as many commentators have noted, in her Jewish context, this pledge would not have been appropriate for women as they were not considered appropriate for servanthood in hours in the house of worship. The combination of menstrual impurity and concepts of shame through mixing of the sexes in a place of worship would not have allowed this. After Mary is born, Hannah invokes God's protection for her and her progeny from Iblis. The result of this wish is confirmed in a well-known prophetic hadith by which Mary and Jesus escaped the pricking of the devil at birth. Haddad and Smith give two examples from the classical commentators. Every descendant of Abraham experiences the touch of Satan except Mary the daughter of Imran and her son. And the second hadith, not a descendant is born, but he is touched by Satan and he comes out crying, except Mary and her son. When Mary is born, she serves in the mihrab, the sanctuary of the temple, which emphasizes a separate physical location where she could devote herself to worship, a place where men had no ex access. And she stays there under the care of Zachariah who is surprised to find Mary receiving food, miraculously, from God. Every time Zachariah entered upon her in the prayer chamber, he found with her provision. This is in the Quran. He said, O oh Mary, from where is this coming to you? And she said, It is from God. Indeed, God provides for whom he wills, without any account. There are two enunciation stories in the Quran, and the following is a longer narration and relates sequence and I'd like to read it all out, actually, so you get a sense. Mary withdrew from her family to an eastern place. She took a curtain to screen herself from them, and we sent our spirit to before her in the, spirit, in the form of a perfected man. She cried in fear, I take refuge with a compassionate from you. Go away if you fear God. But he said, I am only your Lord's messenger, come to announce to you the gift of a pure son. She said, how can I have a son when no man has touched me and I am not unchaste? He said, this is what your Lord said. It is easy for me. We shall make him a sign to all people, a mercy from us. And so it was ordained that she conceived him. She withdrew with him to a distant place 
and when the pains of childbirth drove her to cling to the trunk of her palm, she exclaimed, If only I had been dead and forgotten long before all of this. But a voice cried out to her from below, Do not grieve, for your Lord has provided a stream at your feet, and if you shake the trunk of the palm tree toward you, it will drop juicy dates upon you, so eat and drink and be joyful. And when you see a human being, say, I have vowed a fast to the Lord of mercy to abstain from conversation, and I will not speak to anyone today. Then she went back to her temple, sorry, then she went back to her people, carrying the child, and they said, Oh Mary, what have you done? You have done something terrible. Your father was not a bad man, and your mother was not unchaste. And she pointed towards him, and they, they said, How can we speak to someone who is still an infant? But she, but he said, I am God's servant. He has given me the book and has made me a prophet. He has made me blessed wherever I may be and commanded me to pray and give alms as long as I live to cherish my mother. He did not make me domineering or graceless. Peace was on me on the day I was born and will be on the day I die and the day I am raised to life again. Such was Jesus, son of Mary. In this narration, the reference to God's spirit taking on the form of a perfect man and one who reassures her that he is only a messenger sent by God describes the birth pangs Mary endures when Jesus is born, thus emphasizing the natural and human birth of Jesus and that Mary, like all women, had to suffer pain. The date palm tree which Mary shakes is a dried up tree, but which, when shook, showered fresh dates upon her. Anne-Marie Schimmel writes that this image was taken up by the mystical poets as another sign of divine interjection. For Rumi, had Mary not felt the pangs of labour, she would not have received such a gift in Jesus. He writes, The body is like Mary. Every one of us has a Jesus within him. But until the pangs manifest in us, our Jesus is not born. If the pangs never come, then Jesus rejoins his origin by the same secret path by which he came, leaving us bereft and without portion of him. In the Quran, we have the second Annunciation story in Surah 3, when Mary asks how she will have a son when no human has touched me. The reply is that it is easy for God, who only has to say, be, and it is. These are extraordinary images of female vulnerability and power in the Quran regarding Mary. And although classical commentators debate exactly how the virginal conception took place, <coughs> suffice, it, suffice it to say here that Shiites, like the Sunnis, suppose the spirit that presented itself to Mary was Gabriel. In Luke's Annunciation narrative, the angel says, I am the Lord's servant. Mary answered, May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Joseph Ratzinger wrote that God waits for the freedom of his creature to say yes, and that without this free consent on Mary's part, God cannot become man. Bernard of Clairvaux's homily demonstrates this waiting. The angel awaits your answer, for it is time to return to the one who sent him. O lady, give the answer that earth, that hell, that heaven awaits. In his intriguing work on Mary and Muhammad holding primordial positions as a logos tokos or word bearers for their respective faith, Axel Takac argues that their position implies a special status, for no ordinary human being has the ability to receive the word of God in such immediate and concrete ways as did Mary and Muhammad. They are so special that their essences are seen as existing or at least as preordained before creation of the world. A hadith of the prophet speaks of this. I was a prophet when Adam was still between clay and water. A line from an Egyptian narrative ballad reads, your name, O prophet, is the one chosen in majesty before the firmament together with the highest heaven was founded. He argues a being who will bear the word of God must have a unique cosmological significance, be able to transcend time in order that the events of the world would transpire in such a way so as to prepare for the word bearers 
creation in time. Takach claims that the early church fathers were keen to elaborate on the Eve Mary parallel, thus inserting her into the economy of salvation. Irenaeus of Lyon was the first to say eloquently, the knot of Eve's disobedience was untied by Mary's obedience. If Mary truly destroys the unbelief and disobedience of Eve through her faith and obedience, then she too, just like Muhammad, must have a unique significance. Augustine of Hippo wrote, then at the foot of the cross, he, Jesus, recognized her. Yet he had always known her. Even before he was born of her, he knew his mother in the predestination. Before he, as God, created her from whom he would be created as man, he knew his mother. One finds the significance of Mary elevated to its highest. In the mystery of Christ, she is present even before the creation of the world as the one whom the Father has chosen as mother of his son in the incarnation. Thus the theology and cosmology of the transtemporal and eternal word is intricately connected with the preordained holy man or woman who will bear the revelation in time. Muhammad is believed to have been ummi or illiterate. As such, the miracle of Islam is seen to be the eloquent and beautiful Arabic Quran. Again, Shimmel writes that among other scholars who remarked on this comparison, the mystics have seen in the word illiterate or ummi an expression of the mystery of Muhammad's extremely close relationship with God. He was not only the cupbearer who offered the world the wine of divine wisdom and guidance, but rather he was, as Rumi says, the vessel through which the wine was offered to mankind. As in Christian dogmatics, Mary must be a virgin so that she can immaculately bear the divine word to its incarnation. Thus Muhammad must be ummi so that the inliberation, the revelation of the divine word in the book can happen without his own intellectual activity as an act of pure grace. Mary transmits the word of God made flesh in Jesus Christ, while in Islam, Muhammad trans transmits the word of God, the Arabic Quran. But Takaj is careful to point out that while certain strains of Islamic thought have associated Muhammad directly with the Logos, though not in the same way as in the Christian tradition, Christ is a revelation, while Muhammad is united with the revelation to such an extent that the divine ego, the Logos, has consumed his ego. While he makes his intriguing comparison today in the context of interreligious dialogue, Muslim theologians of the 9th and 10th centuries engaged in polemical discourse with their Christian counterparts, were more concerned with the exact nature of Jesus in relation to Mary, not as word bearer, but in bearing the dual nature of divine and human. In his critique of the Christian faith, Abdul Jabbar asks his Christian counterpart whether Mary truly became pregnant with Christ, gave birth to him, raised him, and fed him like a mother. And I quote from Abdul Jabbar If they say she begot the human nature of Christ, or she became pregnant with the human nature of Christ, we reply, we didn't ask you about this, for according to you, the human nature of Christ is not Christ, for Christ is also the divine nature. According to you, the divine nature of Christ is not Christ, only the combination of the two is Christ. Now answer this, if Mary truly gave birth to Christ and truly became pregnant with him, then she became pregnant with God and man, gave birth to God and man. She is the mother of God and man. God and man were killed, and God and man suffered. God and man died. It is shown that your statement, and the statement of the Melkites and the Jacobites, the other Christians at the time, on this is the same. But if they say, continues Abdul Jabbar, we say she is a mother of Christ metaphorically, and that Christ died metaphorically, we reply to them, we didn't ask you metaphorically, we asked you truly. For by this supposition, Mary's conceiving without a man was metaphorical. Christ bringing the dead to life was metaphorical. And all of what they claim about him is metaphorical. This is nonsense. For if they divide Christ's acts between his divine nature and human nature, this must be done for everything about Christ. 
If he brought the dead to life and made signs appear, that was the action of his divine nature alone. But the divine nature alone is not Christ. People did not see the divine nature, so it's not possible to say that they saw Christ. If he ate, drank, slept and woke, these were the acts of his human nature, but the human nature alone is not Christ. Abdul Jabbar is asking not only about the divine human nature of Christ, born to a fully human mother, but the Christian use of metaphor when explaining Christ's conception and his acts. The emphasis here is on a rejection of the logic of the Christian statements around Mary and the Incarnation, not what Mary means in the life and devotion and Christian piety. The complexity of the divine human nature of Christ begins with a unique conception and birth in Mary, but this relationship, he argues, cannot be a metaphor. But the complexity of this relationship continues to engage Christian theologians today. Although the issue of Christ's dual nature was largely settled by the 5th century, modern theology continues to examine the ways in which Mary can be understood in terms of her own sexual status and what this means for Jesus' divinity. Jürgen Mortmann outlines, outlines the two basic mythical forms of this story. The first is that God brought about the miracle of Mary's pregnancy through the Holy Spirit, so that Jesus is conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. This means that God alone is the Father of Jesus Christ in his whole personhood from the very beginning. Here Joseph is excluded in any concept of early fatherhood. The Holy Spirit is a male seed and Mary, who remains a virgin in the human sense, is Jesus' mother. In the second form, Mortman argues, the stress lies on the motherhood of the Holy Spirit. The Mary who is human and temporal terms is a virgin must be seen as a symbolic embodiment and as the human form of the Holy Spirit, who is eternally virginal and divine mother of Christ. In this way, Mary should not be thought of as a human woman who becomes pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Rather, the Holy Spirit is a great life engendering mother of all the living. The theological intention behind both these positions is to emphasize that Christ is to emphasize that God is the father of Jesus from the very beginning, that his fatherhood does not merely extend to Christ's consciousness and his ministry. It embraces his whole persona and his very existence. Jesus is from the very beginning the messianic son and his beginning is to be found in his birth from the Holy Spirit. But Moltmann also argues that there is a danger of narrowing Jesus' humanity if the virgin birth is taken to mean more of a supernatural human process. He concludes that Christ's birth from the Spirit is a statement about Christ's relationship to God and to God's relationship to Christ. It does not have to be linked with a genealogical assertion. Mary has become the foremost intercessor in Catholic popular piety. It is precisely her human nature that appeals to humanity. Muhammad as well was just a human, as the Quran reminds us several times. He is just a human being like you. But Muslims the world over quickly clarified, true, he is just a human, but he is like the ruby amongst the stones. The human aspect of the Prophet, the possibility of a person-to-person -person encounter with him, who seemed more accessible than the internal divine essence, made the pious turn to veneration of the Prophet, who with all his mystical grandeur still remained a person to whom his fellow creatures could turn in love and hope and admiration. Many years ago, I remember being on holiday in Malta over the Christmas period. In almost every window, there was a Madonna figure, a porcelain or plastic figure of Mary, adoringly holding, holding the baby Jesus. I later realised that the Maltese were devoted to the Assumption of the Virgin, locally known as the Santa Maria. Mary is the co-patroness of the islands. And seeing a small or large stat statuesque in almost every window seemed actually very strange and disturbing to me. It was also the first time I really noticed how pictures and images of Mary adorn Catholic churches all over the world. Veneration through icons is virtually a thing of the past in most of Islamic piety. But at the same time I wondered how much comfort many of her devotees were getting through their possession of a Mary statue, 
a feeling that their homes are protected by the watchful gaze of such a holy figure. Staying with the Muhammad Mary vocation, Muhammad's illiteracy was not praised as the highest and purest vocation in life. But in Christianity, Mary's virginity was indeed elevated to a state almost worthy of imitation. While the Quran emphasizes Mary's chastity and purity, Islam affirming Mary's immaculate conception and the virginal birth, Muslim theology has tended not to regard sexual purity as a desired aspect of a righteous femininity. Chastity before marital relations became morally and legally significant, but it never equated to an obsession for sexual purity as being a divine ideal. Lawful sex is never sinful. Furthermore, Mary's pure and virginal motherhood has not impacted on lessening the status of ordinary motherhood as being stained or unclean. Rather, motherhood has continued to remain probably the most virtuous and socially desirable role still for Muslim women. The doctrinal density associated with Mary in Christian thought has no equivalence in Islam. Mary is given a special status in the Quran, but one could argue that in the Islamic tradition, it is Fatima, the Prophet's daughter and the mother of the tragic heroes, Hassan and Hussein, the Prophet's grandsons, <coughs> who in popular piety at least, are venerated above Mary. As Mary Thurkill writes, the Christian theologians, Mary's mother, um, extolled a more sublime maternal model, wherein the bride wed a heavenly bridegroom and often, but not always, adopted a life of chastity. Fatima in the tr Shia tradition is the archetypal mother and motherhood in its fullest understanding is still the highest accolade. But Fatima is also a political symbol whose patience and suffering transformed a family, a feud into a spiritual family. She writes that in the Christian and Shiite tradition, it is Fatima and Mary who become vessels of God's sublime progeny. Rachel Sered writes also of the ordinary experiences of the saintly female figures in the monotheistic traditions. The experiences in the lives of the female saints that have earned cultic attention are not connected to extraordinary spiritual pursuits or powers. Rachel, Mary and Fatima are not considered holy because of asceticism, contemplation, miracle working or vast learning. On the contrary, the striking features in the biographies of the three saints are the common human situations confronted by each. Death of parents and children, marital love and discord, difficulty conceiving and bearing children, conflict with siblings and parents. These are situations that both resonate with the actual life experiences of most human beings and touch upon the most serious theological and ex existential issues. Some Catholic liberation theologians have also questioned the link between human sex and divine redemption as leading to a preoccupation with sexual sin and defilement and forgetfulness of major sins such as social injustice or male exploitation. The Sri Lankan theologian Tisa Balasurya is considered to be the first Asian liberation theologian who called for a new kind of Mariology in which Mary is a model for human and political liberation in the way Jesus promoted social liberation. In his book, Mary and Human Liberation, he denounced traditional dogmatic theology in the West for its pessimistic anthropology found in the doctrine of original sin. The doctrine of a false, fallen humanity had evolved in the Latin West, but had been forced upon the East as normative theology. Balasuria claimed that for Mary to be a model for humanity, and especially female aspiration, the Mary of real life, and even in the scriptures, cannot be encountered without a deep questioning of this original sin of Mariology. This is an important challenge for the liberation of Mary to be Mary, mother of Jesus, and hence, the one who is concerned with all our concerns. Mariology in the Roman Catholic Church retains a complex life, especially in regards to the issue of ecumenism. Von Balthasar speaks of a particular tension. The place of Mary in the Church's doctrine, in particular Marian veneration and the Mariological saturation of Catholic devotion, has long given rise to tensions within the Church, but none more so than the last decades. Some adhere to the principle of Mary never enough. 
Others suspect a twofold danger. Mariology, they say, threatens the hierarchy of Christian truths, at whose centre are Christ and the triune God, whereas Mary belongs to the side of the graced creature and jeopardises ecumenical dialogue with the ecclesial communities stemming from the Reformation, most of which, with some important exceptions, regard the veneration of Mary as perilous on the organism of Christian devotion. Ratzinger explains in a slightly different manner how the status of motherhood in Mary's first relationship to Christ. Mary underscores the nexus mysterium, the intrinsic interwovenness of the mysteries in the irreducible mutual otherness. While the conceptual pairs, bride, bridegroom and head, body allow us to perceive the connection between Christ and the church, Mary represents a further step inasmuch as she is first related to Christ, not as bride, but as mother. In developing Mariology, Christian theologians developed Christology. But in Islam, Marian piety is not Advent piety. The Islamic tradition regards Mary's position as unique, but her piety has a limited role and no continuing role in eschatology. Her work is complete with Christ's birth and the mission of doing God's new work lies with Christ and not Mary. Christ, however, has a role in both Christianity and Islam, for if for Christians he is the primary source of the eschatological hope, for Muslims his return marks the beginning of the end times. The Quranic Jesus along with the Mahdi are the two actors in Muslim eschatology, but Jesus' return to fight against evil and restore justice is not good news in the Christian sense. The gathering around Jesus Christ is not a fulfillment of the Christian church, but a fulfillment of divinely ordained prophetic mission that will pave the way for the day of judgment. So today, if Mary is to be a model for Muslims, what meaning can be derived from her life, as it doesn't seem to me that she has played a hugely significant role in the history of Islamic thought and piety. As a Muslim, I cannot dwell on Mary without dwelling on Jesus. He remains the star of the story but in a very different way to the Christian story. Mary has no aspirations to be the heroine of the prophetic tale. She just longs to be the servant of God. Whether or not she too has attained prophethood in her own right, she is almost unique in the Quran as a woman who remains an example for the believers, for obedience and willingness. Since the Reformation, Mary has been far more significant for Roman Catholicism than Protestant Christianity and recognising that the virginal conception is problematic for many Christians, Wolfhard Pannenberg asks the phrase, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, how can this still be relevant to Christians in their profession of faith? And he responds, probably most Christians today <coughs> would personally look for a different way of expressing the intention from the one offered by the story of the virgin birth. But that is not of decisive importance when we come into the faith of others. For that, it is enough to agree with the intention, even if the expression of that intention, which we take over at the same time, cannot be our own. This is what justifies us in adopting the creed as an expression of the faith of the church, not only today, but from the very beginning. For the alternative would be not to alter this particular formulation alone, but the whole creed. But it is only in the classic form it is acquired that the creed is a sign of the unity of Christianity throughout history, and that is the reason for its irreplaceable function in the services of the Church today. If the creed, and I'm just about finishing, if the creed in its classic form is a sign of the unity of Christianity, then maybe Mary too, as mother of Jesus, in all the various understandings of this relationship, can remain a hope for a continuing conversation between Christians and Muslims. But for that to happen with any theological as well as devotional relevance, I think there needs to be a resurrection of Mary in Muslim theology, beyond debates around gender, virtue and female piety. This has already happened among some Christian theologians who wish to promote Mary as an image of the liberation of women from poverty and justice. But in Islam, Mary has no such role but the Jesus story pales her own significance. Furthermore, despite theological comparisons, how strongly Mary's role as exemplar 
in the scriptural and theological traditions of medieval Islam translated into the world of living devotion is very difficult to measure. Surah Maryam, it is true, is read and decided by the faithful, by women who are pregnant or praying for a child. But beyond that, Mary doesn't elicit anywhere near any kind of comparative piety or ardour. Yet further reflection on her unique nature may well open up new questions and lead to new engagement in the virtual impasse that is the divine human nature of Jesus for many Christians and Muslims. Mary is the bearer of the word, but it is the nature of this word and the significance of this life in the whole eschatological hope of human existence, which remains the most decisive and the most contested area for Christian Muslim reflection. Let me just leave you with this particular image, going back to the image that I started with at the beginning about the statue of Mary. Um, and this is described by Maura Hurden in the Journal of Ecumenical Studies. Religious tensions between Egyptian Muslims and Christians were particularly high following Egypt's loss to Israel during the Six Day War in 67. In the midst of these tensions, thousands of Muslims, Christians and others were stunned to witness what they believed to be the supernatural appearance of the <coughs> Blessed Virgin near a Coptic church in Zaytun, a district in Cairo. Onlookers noted a marked increase in piety as well as signs of unprecedented interreligious tolerance between Muslims and Christians during the time of the apparition. The figure floated above the domes of the church and appeared to glow. The first people to witness this event awoke the rector of St. Mary's Church, who immediately recognised the woman, the Blessed Virgin. Her identification rests on the crowd's association of the woman with typical artistic depictions of Mary, the apparition's silent acknowledgement of the crowd's praises, and the fact that her appearances, which continued for the next 14 months, there were more than 70 recorded apparitions, so that the site became one of pilgrimage for Muslims, Christians, and all the curious of other faiths, and those who had no faith at all. For those months, Mary became the symbol of peaceful coexistence at a time of rising tension. In other words, just the sight of an apparition made people simply get on better with each other. Thank you. <laughs>